Uh, that's fine. Oh, uh, okay. I'll, I'll take the, I'll take it off then. Oh, there we go. There we go. There it is. <laughs> okay, so I have started recording, so we're ready to start the meeting. Okay, meeting is on. And we don't know anything about Joe, right? We don't. As and, far as I know, he was going to participate, and he asked yeah. me if I am. Yeah, I thought he was too. Yeah. Well, maybe he'll he'll be along. Yeah, um, maybe join a little late. So, Maureen, did did you say there's going to be guests? Are they? There is. So, could you start the meeting um, and open the meeting and introduce yourselves? Oh, okay. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know they were with us yet. The guests. They are. They are. Hello, guests. <laughs> 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 I'm Jerry Weiss, the chair of the Disability Access Advisory Committee, and I'll let the other members introduce themselves. I'm Saran Darren. I'm Myra Ross. I'm Tori Dixon. I'm Ruth Smith. And there's uh, one person missing who may come along at some point in the meeting. So um, Trin, I'm Elise. Oh, I, Elise, you know what? Yeah, There's no picture. I don't no see picture. my picture, so I don't know whether I'm actually there. Yeah, you're, you're there. here. I'm you sorry, are. Elise. Yeah. Okay. You, you show up as 927-0316. Oh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's no, there's just I no can picture. I could probably change that. That's why uh, I didn't introduce you. Yeah. Oh, uh, I, I'm, yeah. Elise, uh, she Elise. would need, Elise. Elise. Uh, Sorry, I'm gonna do that every time. At least I think you have to change. Well, let's see if I can figure that out. I might be able to change your name. Oh, re rename. Rename. E L Y S S E. Yeah. E. Or e L Y S S E. Yeah. E link. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I had to type in the Webner in order to. I tried zooming again, and I had to type the Webner number in, and that's what got me in. Yeah, that's what I had to do too. I had to figure that out. Yeah. So <laughs> I made it. Hi, everybody. Hi, there. Hi. Hi, Elise. Hi, Elise. So, so um, I have, uh, uh, Jerry, do you have the, the agenda? Um, I have the, the agenda. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I, the, I have it typed out. Okay. So you call you call to order are there yes. any uh, announcements that any of the board members um, want to make uh, that that is not on the agenda um, hey, i'd i'd like to make one please yes. remove uh, only leave me star serendarin at yahoo.com in your contacts oh ha, okay you want the yahoo email only yes Oh, okay. And I've been probably using your uh, Stavros email. Yeah, I don't get any of those. Oh, okay. That's good to know. All right. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, I have one announcement is I, I got a call from Paul Bockelman, who, who is um, in the process of replacing members of the committee. I'm go apparently going to be first off the committee. <laughs> but I haven't heard from him for a month, so I don't know what's what's exactly happening. Okay. Oh, I'll, 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 I'll talk you know, to you. Uh, I I was looking at the newspaper, and they were they were there was an article encouraging people to join committees, and DAC yeah. was in that group, and yes. I said, hmm, yeah. I th I think there have been some applications. Oh, maybe. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, it's not, like a, lot it's not a COVID cough. It's, it's an allergy cough. It's not a COVID cough. <laughs> Joe is here now. Hey, Joe. No, he's not quite here. He's he's probably he's setting up to be here. Here he is. Yeah. Hi, Joe. <laughs> Joe, Hi, I'll, Joe. Mute. Uh, I'll, I'll mute him. Let's see if that works. You're muted, Joe. How about now? Ah, good. Hey, hey, there he is. Hi, Joe. <laughs> I figure if I hit enough buttons, I'm eventually I'll get it somewhere. Here we 
I don't know where, but uh, at least I'm okay. here. Well, I perfect think. timing. We're just starting. Um, in consideration of our guests, maybe we'll we'll start with our guests, and if anyone has any other announcements, we'll take care of it at the end of the meeting. Does that sound good? Yes. That sounds yes. Great. I think we have guests ready. Let's roll. Sounds good. Okay, so I'm going to make all the guests from Valley CDC uh, a panelist. That means your your camera and your microphone will be enabled now. So, and you can share um, any slides or PDFs that you want to share with the, the board members. Okay. So is Tom part of your group? Yes, he is. Okay. All right. And so if you, well, I'm making him a panelist. Let's see if that works. And Hi, Laura. Hi, Jerry. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Oh, and Jane is with us as well. Oh, okay. Let's see here. Oh, where? Uh, is Hi, Jane. Me? Oh, Jane. Okay, I made Jane. Could you use your last names too? Yeah, I figured we'd do some introductions as oh, soon okay. as we're done with the technical issue, issues. Okay. So is Tom, let's see if Tom is able, okay, I pressed unmute for Tom, and then I'm going to put his, can ask him to, I can hear him. And Jane, does your, does your microphone work? Maybe you just need to press unmute. Hold on a second. Yeah, there we go. There we go. There we go. Yep. All right. There we go. All right. Perfect. <laughs> Yay. And yeah. uh, um, all right. Perfect. We're here. So uh, thank you so much, Laura. Uh, uh, let's go around and uh, if you don't mind, introduce yourself uh, selves to the DAAC members. Uh, my name is Laura Baker. I'm the Real Estate Project Manager from Valley Community Development Corporation, and we're happy to be with you today, hoping to get your feedback on a proposed new um, affordable housing development. Uh, and with me is... I am uh, Jane Leckler. Good morning. Um, new Executive Director, uh, working with Joanne Campbell uh, this month for a transition period. Um, happy to meet you all. And uh, I'm uh, Tom Chalmers from Austin Design, the architects of the project. So I have prepared um, some slides that we could go through. And I'm just curious how many folks <laughs> in this committee will be able to see the slides. I will not be able to see them. I was kind of thinking maybe not, Myra. Oh. <laughs> OK. So I'll, you know, I'll try to do my best to to describe some of it's just text and that's easy. Some of it's pictures and that's a little harder. Okay. Um, but I'm gonna attempt to share screen and show you first, uh, give you kind of a, a background overview of this proposed affordable housing development. Um, and then after that, we'll show you some plans and get it a little bit more into the meat of the physical layout of the site um, and the building. So this is my first time sharing screen. Everybody hold on. <laughs> Oop. Do you see a screen with yes. some nice job? Yes. Yes. <laughs> really yes. Nice. I was hoping nice I could and get nice and it. big. I don't know if I can make it. Go to the bottom right. Yeah. Of your of your PowerPoint and uh, next to the minus button. Yeah. To the left of the minus button, there's a yep. that, that will make it the full. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, yeah. great. Very nice. Great. Wonderful. Okay. It's pretty exciting. I'm excited. So this is, <laughs> um, we're currently calling this Amherst Studio Apartments. It may get a, a more lyrical name at some point. Um, it's located at 132 Northampton Road in Amherst, which is also known as Route 9. Um, Valley Community Development Corporation is a nonprofit. Uh, we're based in Northampton. We're about 30 years old. And one of the things that we do is develop affordable housing. Um, and we've done several developments previously um, in Amherst, some in Northampton and one in East Hampton. So this is um, an aerial view showing you the site. So the site is in kind of a light green color. Um, it's about halfway up Northampton Road between University Drive and Town Center. Um, if you know where the Amherst College uh, Fieldhouse is, it's directly next door to the Fieldhouse. And you can see on this image 
um, the track is right behind it. So we're, this parcel is surrounded on two sides by Amherst College Athletic Fields property. Feel free to jump in if you have questions. How big is the site? Um, it is 0.88 acres, so just uh -huh. under an acre. Okay. So we, we looked for several years to find a site for this type of housing development, and we were especially looking for something within half a mile of the town center, which this is. It's a four, four tenths of a mile from the town center in the nearest bus stop. It's six tenths of a mile downhill to the shopping centers that are there. Uh, it's walking distance to quite a, quite a few amenities in, in Amherst, including the uh, Musanti Health Center. Uh, it's on a major road, as we talked about. It's on public water and sewer. It's, it's just under an acre lot. It's cleared and relatively level for Northampton Road. Um, it's in a mixed use area. So there's college property. There's a lot of residential abutters, both single family and multifamily. Um, on Northampton Road, there's a couple of residence halls. The Arbors is not too far away. So it's kind of a, a grab bag of things in this neighborhood, but mostly residential. Um, what we're proposing to build is uh, one single building that will be, have two and a half stories that will include 28 very small studio apartments. So they're really efficiencies. Um, they have kind of a living area. I'll show you floor plans later, but each one has a kitchenette and its own bathroom. Uh, common areas will include a kind of living area, common laundry, outdoor patio and garden space. We'll have two offices on site, one for property management and one for a resident services coordinator. Um, this property is designed as supportive housing. Not everyone who need, lives there will need supports, but some folks will. Um, so I give you some information about um, some income statistics in Amherst, just as a point of comparison. So, um, you can see the median per capita income in Amherst is about $20,000. The median single person household income is about $28,000. And the median rental household income for rental households of all sizes is about $29,000. So the renter households in Amherst earn substantially less than the owner occupied types of households. Um, we're proposing eight of these uh, studio apartments would have an income cap of just under $30,000. 50% of the area median income, and they would house mostly working folks uh, earning kind of anywhere between minimum wage and a little bit above minimum wage. Um, the eight of them would have an income cap of $47,850. So associate level administrative staff, paraprofessionals, social workers, adjunct faculty would all kind of fall within that um, income group. Um, that two uh, apartments would be set aside for uh, clients of the Department of Mental Health. These could be folks who are uh, disabled, employed part-time, employed full-time. Um, they will receive ongoing clinical and support services from the Department of Mental Health. Um, and 10 of these apartments will have a homeless preference uh, and an income cap, uh, similarly low income cap of $17,950. These very low income um, profiles will have rental based subsidies. So the folks who live there will pay 30% of their income toward rent. So uh, homeless how people. Are how many are going to be uh, um, homeless? Uh, no, how many of these apartments are going to be Section 8? So there will, we anticipate there will be 12 apartments that will have a project based voucher. It might be a Section 8 or it might be an MRVP. So either a state or federal project-based voucher. Yeah. And did you say the person would have a choice of having the Department of, uh, of uh, Mental Health? Would the people need to have the services or not? No. no, the services are voluntary. But there will be two apartments that are um, kind of referred from the Department of Mental Health for their clients. So in those two apartments, we know that those folks will be receiving services from the Department of Mental Health and these so are deep, by design. Subsidies. I'm assuming these are deep subsidies. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. 
When you so, talked about the eight for the 47,000, are they paying 30% as well? Or how does that no. work? So the, the people in the 50%, 80% AMI rents, there will be fixed rental amounts. Um, somewhere between $650 and $700 a month, including all utilities. What is the AMI in Hampshire County, just for the heck of it? I don't know. For a single person household? Yeah. Um, I believe it is about, let's see if it's 47. It's probably about... About 60? 50, yeah, I think it's about 60. Okay. So um, the, the 10 studios, which will have a homeless preference, which was really kind of part of the impetus for developing this housing from the perspective of the town and the Amherst Municipal Housing Trust, um, was really to provide a place for folks who might be in, in, living at Craig's Doors or otherwise homeless. And homeless has a pretty broad definition. Could be someone who's trying to get away from domestic violence, someone who's living doubled up, someone who's in an uh, unsafe apartment, someone who's paying way too much of their income for rent, or literally a person who is living outdoors who has no home. So it's a pretty broad definition. So 10 units are designated that way. What are the priorities? Among the homeless tenants? Well, for... Uh... You know, so in, in some areas, resident, uh, local residents are right. a high priority. Veterans right. have high priority. Of, sure. You know, it's, I mean, people so, who pay more than 50% of their income, nowadays, everybody qualifies for that. So yeah. that's, you know, of yeah. course, domestic violence, yeah. uh, escaping domestic violence or being displaced for no, uh, no fault of their own. So I'm just curious. Have you set up a, a system of uh, priorities for this? Oh, shoot, I just lost my screen. Hang on one second, sorry. <laughs> uh, you still see it. You still see it? Shoot, I don't uh, see it. To the bottom yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, we see it. You just, uh, you click out of the presentation mode. Okay. Go to the bottom right, just like yep. before. Thank you, Maureen. Ah. So we are just starting the zoning process. If there will be a local preference, which is possible, it would be something that would be set by the town. So we suspect they'll request that, but they, they have the power to do that, the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, other preferences will have to do with fitting within these different categories. And then typically there's a marketing period and we do a lottery. So. Some of it's being the right um, type of tenant, having the right income profile, and then some of it's chance having to do with the lottery itself. Um, so on-site services that we're proposing are to have a resident services coordinator uh, um, approximately 30 hours a week to basically connect people with community-based services. Sorry, that's me. Um, having some property management staff on site. Um, and then we'll have agreements with other community agencies. I have a question. Um, yep. Having spent a lot of time in the schools, a lot of the people who are homeless have kids. Um, and these don't seem like they would be acceptable places for a single parent with a kid sure. or two to live, right? Sure. No, this have is you... designed for individuals. So the state has... Um, basically a requirement that they need to house homeless families. Um, they don't have that requirement for homeless individuals. Ah, okay. So we can see that homeless families, there was a big to-do because a lot of homeless families were housed in hotels and motels. For I was going to say, they're not terribly well housed. So right. but there's a lot of kids that don't have a place to live. They have a state priority in okay. a different way than individuals. Um, okay. So it's not that that's not also a need. It's not a need being addressed by this particular um, development. Okay. So accessibility features that we um, are including, and this is kind of where we wanted to get your input, uh, most especially. Um, two of the 28 units, uh, which is 7% of the units, are fully handicapped accessible. And they're significantly larger than the other units. They're still small units, but they're bigger than the other ones. Um, actually, this is incorrect. Two units will be adapted for tenants who have sensory impairments. All of the common areas... What does that mean? 
So for I'll let Tom talk about it. It's okay. I think. Go ahead, Tom. <laughs> Mute myself. Um, so usually, what we've done in the past with that is we've had um, a device uh, set up in the unit to um, have to provide uh, this hearing. Um, to, to provide uh, sound for doorbells, um, enhancements for telephones, um, and of course, alarm signals. So visual signals as well as auditory signals. So when you say alarm, sensory, yeah. you mean deaf? Yes. Okay. Well, we can talk more about that. So the uh, common areas, both inside and outside, are fully accessible to someone in a wheelchair. Um, the building is equipped with an elevator, so there's full vertical access. Um, two of the 16 parking spaces, 12.5% are accessible and they're located closest to the building's main entry. Uh, the main entry is on grade. Uh, we worked very hard to achieve that, so there's no kind of ramp needed to get into the building. Uh, all the paths and walkways on the site will meet universal access codes, so we don't have any ramps or handrails. Um, the entry door will have an electronic uh, paddle, push paddle opener. Uh, all the door hardware, door openings, and passageways will meet accessibility code. Uh, all the interior signage will include braille. Um, and I just added that service animals are permitted. Um, in general, pets won't be allowed, but service animals will be permitted, which is not specific to this. I think it's it's required by law. Um, What's the appropriate documentation? For having a service animal? Yeah. You know, it's not really exactly what I do. I believe typically people have a, a doctor's letter. I think yeah. that's true. We see a lot of service animals, both, you know, the traditional ones as well as the emotional support service animals are are quite common. Yeah. There's some specifics around the reasonable accommodation request there about, you know, there's private residents have their privacy in, um, in terms of what their impairment is, but then they just make that request of what the service animal will provide. That's pretty straightforward. How will, um, you, how will you designate the uh, HP parking? For example, is it going to be first come, first serve? Uh, is it going to be... Uh, Whoever, uh, you know, it's, it's not uncommon for people to um, end up having disputes over hmm. whether or not it's my parking spot. No, it's my parking spot. Right. So how are so, you going to do that? Yeah. Um, we had sometimes the opposite experience where we are required to provide a certain number and, and they sit vacant. Um, so I think we'll we'll field test it. So we have two accessible units and two accessible parking spaces. It, it is common that we have um, persons using accessible units who don't have a car. So I honestly think it's a problem, a, a bridge that will cross uh, when we get to it, if it in fact turns out to be an issue. We certainly could designate them for tenants if there was a need to do that. I would think that they would have preference over visitors or someone else. Will there be visiting parking? Because if someone has a PCA, uh, is there parking nearby or on the yeah. ground? We'll talk about parking. I'll, I'll show you the site plan and we can show you the parking that's available. Okay. Um, so if people are- meaning about the signage. Um, you said the braille signage. Does that yep. mean the, the room number, the apartment yeah. numbers? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what other signage there would be, but right. the apartment numbers will be brailled is what you're saying. So typically all the interior signage, it's apartment numbers, it's wayfinding signs, it's safety, you know, fire egress kinds of signs. It's, elevator you know, buttons. Elevator, yep, elevator, you know, buttons and instructions also in Braille. I guess a question for the architect is, do you know anything about interior beacons? The alarm beacons? No. Uh, beacons that you can read with some technology that uh, wow. enable you to find your way, wayfinding beacons? Uh, I don't know much about that, no. Okay, might be something, they're not, it's, um, if, if they're, um, I'm not sure you need it for this kind of a place, um, 
but there are ways they they put um, things on the wall that emit an electronic um, I don't even know what it is not a sound but it's a <laughs> pulse or whatever you can't tell unless you have a device like a phone that's going to pick it up but but more and more they're using it for interior wayfinding for blind people mm -hmm. um, so that they can figure out uh, that's usually it's in a much bigger building um, right. but I was just wondering since you're building it and the and the intention is to be completely accessible it might be something to consider I don't think it's very expensive mm -hmm. so okay. we like for accessible to define the route and how to get in and out and get to the main common spaces and stuff well, you know, like if if you knew that you were setting a beacon, if you wanted to go to the common space, yep. um, if there was a beacon that. on the common space, you you would go to your phone, find the beacon for the common space, yep. and you would be able to get directions to get there. Yeah. So, Myra, does the device that you're holding, as the person who's sight impaired, give you then? Does it talk to you and give you directions like it's a, a phone? Yeah. It's like a. You know, it, it's a phone, and I guess we can say, well, how many really low-income people have iPhones? But it's pretty amazing how many do. Yeah, no, it's becoming more of a necessity. So. Yeah, so it, it's just okay. it's a phone, an Android or an iPhone. Yeah, um, okay. You can access the beacons with those. That is very cool. Okay, so I'm going to try a new share. Maureen, if I hit this new share, will I get to, to share a different file? Yes, yes. Okay. yes. Awesome. Please leave a message after the tone. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, that's my landline, which I never answer anyhow. So uh, if that. it's helpful for people, um, I do this with other boards. Uh, you might want to mute your individual uh, uh, okay. microphones. And okay. when you Let want to ask a question or make a comment, then unmute yourself. Just so we don't have all these noises. It's not that easy for me to know when I'm muted unless you hear all the feedback from my computer. Sure, Myra, so, you can, you can, you feel free to keep yours unmuted. Okay, and I mean, I can do it, feels... but I won't know when I'm muted and when I'm not, unless the speech on my computer is on, which you don't want to hear. And then no one ever responds to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, so uh, did you so, figure out the new share? I am having trouble. <laughs> I'm going to okay, minimize uh, what I could do with my earphones. Oh, yeah, because this is a screen. Minimize it. Minimize. I see your screen. So uh, minimize your PowerPoint. I see your mouse. If that's helpful. So I have it on my desktop, but I'm not sure how to share it with you folks. Can you move your mouse? Yeah. Oh, I, we don't see the mouse moving. Okay, uh, this is what, close your, um, close your PowerPoint and maybe, um, maybe, what are you trying to show? Is it a, power, is it a PDF or a yeah, PowerPoint? Yeah, it's a PDF. Huh, interesting. And I think, I think, Laura, I think you need to start a new share. Okay. Oh yeah, that's what, sorry. You need to yeah, start so a new share. Sorry, new I didn't, share. And you can yep. either share the file or the screen. It's easier if you share the screen because then you can go back and forth between the files. Thank you. Can Tom. you guys see that? No. Ooh, so, it uh, says your screen sharing is paused. I don't know how yeah. to stop it from say, saying uh, that. Okay. Um, pause. Okay. S can you stop it? Can you see it now? No. It says, it says it's I'm tiny. Well, it's, it was the same page from before. It, that this is the uh, accessibility features include. Yeah. Oh. So my, on my screen, I see it. Okay. Nope. Uh, stop. Uh, do you have a button that says share screen or new sh uh, new share? Yep. Okay. Press that button. And now you'll probably have all these options of what you could share. Yeah. Do you see uh, what you're trying to share? Okay. Uh, there we go. Is, uh, this is good experience for for if for uh, the twenty fifth. <laughs> well done, Maureen. That was some good coaching for you. <laughs> I, 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 well, this is my works, this is works. <laughs> uh, the, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, Zoom is my new life. So, <laughs> all right. So, 
this is just a cover sheet. Um, we're going to look at not the whole plan set, but ones that I thought might be most relevant <coughs> for you guys. Um, so what we're looking at now are basically 3D renderings of what this building will look like from different angles. Can everybody see it? No, I'm fine. Um, yes. It keeps jumping. Oh yeah, that's me. Sorry. I'll hold it okay. still. So, um, you know, for Myra's benefit, it's an attempt to, to really replicate some of the more traditional Victorian style buildings. Um, <laughs> we used as our model some of the residence dormitory halls on Amherst campus and Smith campus, um, because we're trying to get it to blend into what the, the neighborhood looks like. So I'm going to move to the next page, which is um, the site plan. So this is showing in the area that's colored is the site. You see Northampton Road in front. The driveway is moving a little bit from its current location, but pretty much staying in the same uh, part of the site. You drive in. We are proposing 16 parking spaces that you see along here. Um, there are two accessible ones right near this is the main entry, uh, and this is the main entry lobby. The spaces are in the front or in the back? The spaces are next to the building. So this next building is a, it's kind of a narrow, deep lot. And so the building itself is toward the rear of the lot. And the good thing about that is we preserve a lot of green space along Northampton Road and buffer the, the noise of Northampton Road a bit. There are walkways that take you from the building um, out to the sidewalk that's along Northampton Road, and mm -hmm. also a walkway that takes you to a front entrance and then around the other side of the building to an outdoor patio space and back into the building. So in terms of who gets to park where, the parking is primarily for residents, although we do assume that um, service providers who will primarily be daytime visitors will also park in this area. Um, and that those tenants who have cars are most often going to be not parked there during the day. So they'll most frequently be there parked overnight or on the weekends. Um, we did a lot of study about how many parking spaces are needed, and I'm sure we'll talk more with the Zoning Board of Appeals about it. Um, the nature of housing very low income folks is many of them, most of them do not have cars. So we want to have enough parking, but we don't want to have tons of extra parking. So this is our best attempt to estimate how many parking spaces will actually be needed both by residents as well as um, the occasional service coming How many on. did you say? Did you say 16? 16. Or did I make that up? 16. 16. 16. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a double driveway coming in. There are dumpsters back here, a little garden shed. We have some garden spaces designated outside, some mechanical equipment that's outside, the footprint of the building. And again, we have a patio out here. There's a lot of vegetative screening going on to, you know, shield the parking lot and to shield, give some privacy here for the patio and also on the border with the Amherst College field. That was something the college was interested in, was having a little bit of, you know, just a little bit of separation of uses. Do you know what kind of materials will be used for the walkways and for the yes, patio? Yes, I kind of do. So this primary walkway coming in, I believe is concrete. And then these smaller pathways, we're proposing to use, it's like a recycled rubber composite so it's somewhat permeous um i think it's a great surface honestly for for everybody um it's it's forgiving and a little cushy um so we want to use that for the smaller pathways um the, the driveway itself is asphalt um and then there are eight parking spaces that are grasscrete which is um again it's a more pervious type of paving um it's kind of a cement block that grass can grow up through so you give more of a green feeling to the site than just having so much blacktop, but it's still permanent parking. Who's going to pull the weeds that grow up instead of the grass? They're going to mow it. It'll be, you'll <laughs> mow it. You'll mow okay. it just like you mow grass. Um, and same thing back here. We have a, a turning area for emergency vehicles and for the dumpster truck to kind of pull in here 
and do a turn, three point turn, so they can collect from the dumpsters and head out, <coughs> head on into Northampton Road. It's not a place you'd want to back onto. Um, everybody who parks here will also be able to kind of um, pull out and go head first um, when they exit onto Northampton Road. Will the patio also be made of the same material, the rubber? It looks, it, I think, you know, we're early, so some of these things are still up for discussion. We typically we try to use a brick paver for a patio area, but we are open to suggestion on that. It's a little more, you know, attractive than concrete, but yeah. so I, I think that's the surface that's shown here at this point in time. And how big yeah, is the wonder... patio? The patio, do you have a of square footage uh let me think i am i'm gonna guess for you it's a it's an odd kind of almost round shape so i'm going to guess it is about maybe 20 to 25 feet across maybe 20 20 25 feet as a round area it's a good size we can fit some tables we have some rolling planters um, that we're showing there also, at the, on one of the walkways, we have a smoking designated smoking area, which is a controversial item. Uh, this would be a smoke-free building, um, but we did want to allow for a space on site where people could smoke. So it has that would a be like a shed. Yeah, it's got a it's a bench that will have a covered roof over it. Okay, so if if anyone's ever been to like River Valley Co-op, they have like a shed for a, smoke, for a smoking area for their employees. So it'd be something like that. Uh, it's, it just has a comparable, but yeah. 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 Well, you, know, you, wanna have to, it, you wanna have are the benches, area. Are the benches with the tables and seats, are the seats, are the, is that fixed seating? No. Good. Yeah. Someone well, else is trying to ask a question. I'm sorry, um, I just want to make a comment. Um, I live in a smoke-free building too, and yeah. um, it's great. The thing is, you want to make sure that the smoking area is away from people's windows, not right. too close mm -hmm. to the building. Right. You know, because yep. it does permeate and go yes. into people's windows. It is such a tricky thing. Yeah. So if you look here at this part of the building, there's no windows in this section, so wet wall. So it's, it was placed pretty strategically to try to get it away from people's windows, but oh, also good. keep it away from the field and keep it away from the patio and keep it away from pedestrians going by on Northampton Road. You know, it's just no one really wants to be near the smoke if they're not smoking. So it's always a challenge uh, on a site to find a good spot for it. I'm going to keep Great. moving along. Um, these are elevations of the building. This is the side that would face the driveway. And this is where I you just, this is Tori. I wanted to make a comment about the sure. patio and the picnic area. Sure. Um, and you you mentioned something about brick, and yep. that that material is not always very good for people walking on crutches or even using wheelchairs or scooters. Yep. Yeah. Can I, I will, I'll add something to that. I agree with that. Um, pavers is not the best surface. Um, what we've used in the past would be um, we can use a, a concrete that has stamp pattern in it. Um, oh, okay. But okay. yes, pavers is, is much more maintenance and it's very easy to get large, you know, more than quarter inch differences in height and all kinds of issues. Um, okay. So we'll, we'll look at services, but we are definitely cognizant of that paving issue. Any kind of pattern um, could be also difficult if you're using a cane because it gets stuck in crevices. Yeah. yeah. What do yeah. people suggest as a preferred surface for a patio? Something smooth. Yeah. Like concrete. Or what do you guys, smooth. are you familiar with this recycled um, rubber kind of composite? It's nope. like they use it in playgrounds and things. It's, it's, yeah. it gives good grip. So you're not gonna slip on it. Anybody have opinions about that? How is it in snow and ice? Snow and ice, how will it ice up in the winter? No more than everything else ices up. Yeah, you okay. just shovel it off. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, if anybody has a brainstorm um, about a great patio surface, um, 
because concrete can be a little bit slippery. Um, so, you know, we're open to suggestions on that. Yeah, and then if it, it, oh, uh, I was just going to say, if any members, um, you know, after this meeting, yeah, think of a, a, a material that you would prefer, feel free to email me uh, any comments, actually, in general about this project, and I can I forward them to, the, uh, to Laura. Yep. Maureen, I just want to say that I would assume whoever um, is responsible for taking care of the building overall would all, and when it's icy and snowy, would get out there and clean yes. that walkway anyway. So, yeah. So we Valley, we we hire a professional property management company to do the maintenance, and they're pretty vigilant um, about clearing snow and ice. So, they would do that work. Okay. So this is an elevation of the building. Uh, this is facing the driveway and you would enter here these double doors. It's just a very gradually graded walkway that would take you from the parking area uh, into the main lobby. The, slight is a, the site is a little bit sloped. So you'll see that there's some portions of this ground floor that are below grade. And then it kind of opens out to grade on the opposite side. Excuse me, will the main door automatically open or people will have to uh, push the electric, um, you know, the gadget paddle. to get in? Yeah, we'll probably have a paddle that people push to, to automatically open that door. Okay. Um, it's a little tricky. I'm doing a project now where we're integrating it. This building will have an intercom system. So, you know, that securing the building and yet providing um, access is it's just tricky so okay. in our case you have to press the intercom someone has to buzz you and when they buzz you the doors open and that would be this scenario that you would press the button uh to be allowed in and then you'd press the the paddle yeah or or the doors would automatically open if someone buzzed a visitor in and just everybody gets the door to open for them but something like that where you can still secure the building and yet have the door operate automatically when it's needed to sure so yeah sure so you're looking into op options is that what you're yep. saying or okay yep. Yep. is the intercom going to be outside or is it going to be between two sets of doors I think it's, Tom, do you know the answer to that? Is it going to be in the lobby or in the outs outside this main oh, door? I think it would be in the lobby. Okay. So, so in a way, it'll be well, like a vestibule. No, actually, it's going to have to, in this case, it's going to have to be outside, it, but it's a covered space outside. Right. Okay. That might be a place to put the beacon so people can find the intercom if they can't see it. Mm. Yep. Right. Great. So Great feedback. So, <clears throat> I saw a mention of keypads. Uh, where are the keypads going to be? My concern is, uh, depending on the height of the keypads or someone's ability, uh, dexterity ability, to manipulate the keypads, um, I wonder if there's a wand or something that could be used um, along with the keypad for people who can't uh, manipulate the, the numbers. So, is this on each apartment, Joe? You saw there's a keypad? Or where is the where are the keypads? I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm, I saw in one of the, the previous slides <clears throat> a mention of keypads. I'm just not sure if it was for the uh, general entrance or, f or for the apartments or... I think the general entrance. Sorry, I couldn't find what you're looking for. <laughs> so, so there's a paddle push you know, like the large, you know, metal push panel at the main door. And then there will be an intercom system. So if you are the first <laughs> and you're coming, you would need to be able to buzz somebody's apartment. They have to let you in. Um, all of that would be mounted within, you know, the ADA reach area. Yeah. So I think it's just pushing one button. It's not like pushing a sequence of buttons. You're just letting your the person who lives there know that you're there. They'll be able to see you. There'll be a view screen and they'll see it's you, Joe, and then they'll push the button and you'll hear a buzz and then you'll be able to enable the door to open. Mm -hmm. I thought he was asking if you live there, how do you, do you have keys or do you have? Yeah, typically keypad? we'll use actual keys. 
we, you know, there's a lot of discussion about fobs versus keys. Um, so far, we've been liking the keys um, better than the fobs. So that's what I anticipate. I'll tell you, I have a, I have a number pad um, now instead of a key. It's the yeah. best thing that ever happened to me. You can't <laughs> lock yourself out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we can talk a little bit. Some sometimes the accessible units have different features than okay. and the other units might have. Um, so at any rate, this is the main elevation, main entry. We're going to move to the other elevations. Um, this is the side of the building that is actually kind of fronting toward Route Nine itself, toward Northampton Road. This is the side of the building that will be facing toward the Conway Fieldhouse, kind of downhill. And these double doors here are the ones that will egress onto the patio. And then this is the back of the building that will face uh, basically the track, the athletic field. Um, okay, so this is the first, this is the ground floor. So the ground floor sits partially below grade and, and partially at grade. Um, what's kind of unusual and a little hard to understand about this is this is the lobby here, which is at grade. And so, and it's really the only part of the building that's directly at grade. So you come in here and you have a choice. You can hop on the elevator, which is right here, and it will take you to the ground floor, the first floor, or the second floor. Or you can take a few steps up to the first floor or some steps down to the ground floor. So on the ground floor, we have um, most of the common areas. There's a shared laundry room here. There's a mechanical room. Um, we have an office here for the resident services coordinator. We have a public bathroom that's accessible. And we have a common room, which is the main kind of living space that people can gather. Um, and the common room connects to that outdoor patio. So those spaces are connected. Um, and the, the part of the building that's lowest, that has the least window exposure, is this end. And so you see we've clustered like stairs and mechanical room and laundry down there. Um, and then the units themselves all have full windows above grade. So these are typical units that you're seeing around here. If you look close, you can see furniture is laid out in these units. Each one has a small bathroom and each one has a little kitchenette area with a range, a sink, a full-size refrigerator, a microwave, a little bit of counter space, a little bit of cabinets. What's the square footage on the apartments that are um, not the bigger ones? Yep, so the non-ADA apartments average about 235 square feet. Oh, wow. They're teeny. Okay. Yeah. So this is the first floor, and this is where you see the accessible unit is stacked on top of that common room that was on the, the ground floor. And it's almost 400 square feet. So it's quite a bit larger than um, the typical apartments. The apartment sizes vary a bit depending on whether it's, you know, where it is in the building, if it's kind of an L-shaped corner unit or a central unit. Um, but they all have pretty good um, natural light coming in. They're all facing, you know, outdoor views with the corridor in the middle. Um, property management office is here on this first floor and the rest of this is residential units. We have stair towers on either end for, for emergency egress and then the stair tower in the middle. And then this is the upper floor. Again, we have another uh, accessible unit stacked on top of the one on the floor below and we have more residential units on this floor. These are some close-ups of what some sample units might look like in this building. Um, just so you can see the layout a little bit more clearly. Um, and one of these sample units, this 1-04, um, is the accessible unit. And primarily in the accessible units, the differences have to do with size and uh, facilities in the bathroom. They'll have a roll-in shower versus, you know, yeah. another kind of shower. Um, and clearances for wheelchair. And then the kitchens, which will have a separate wall oven from a range. They'll have a roll-under sink some of the typical things that you'd see in a, an ADA kitchen. 
Um, so I have a question about the microwave and the range. I did write to Maureen. I don't know if you received what I wrote. I did. Um, okay. We did. Um, for blind people these days, microwaves yeah. and ranges are major problems because yeah. so many of them have to do with touch screen, which is light touch, meaning if you touched it, it acti activated. It right. used to be that touch screens or some that are much more difficult to find right now are touch and press screens, which can be marked with yeah. icons. Right. Um, but the, the, the light touch ones are completely inaccessible. Right. Um, if they are, you, you know, and that'll be an issue for the microwaves. I expect that probably the ranges that you're going to use are going to be all with uh, knobs. Is that yes. right? That's, That's right. right. Yeah. Okay, so there's not going to be any touch screen for the oven? No. On any of the stoves? No. Nope. Okay, and also, I mean, just a pet peeve of mine, it's not having to do with the law. Yeah. But there are a lot of stoves that they used to make with all the controls on the back. And you had, oh, to God, your yeah. hand, you had to stick yeah. your hand through all of the uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> hot stuff. To yeah, so hopefully you you're going to get, yeah, hopefully you're gonna get ones with the knobs on the front. Yeah. We'll get yes. ones yeah, I had to get a new front. stove just like that for that yeah. reason. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so the knobs on the front and no touch screens um, yeah. that, uh, right. can't be, that, that can't be touched and pressed. Right. So thank you for bringing this to our attention, Myra. It was something that wasn't really on our radar. I think we're good with the range and the stove. I think the microwave yes. and the intercom and yes. actually the controls for the HVAC, for the heat and cooling. Correct. Yes. We'll need the research because they all are going to these smart screens and I hear what the problem is. I don't they, know. The um, they problem. do make thermostats that you can use your phone. I mean, assuming people have a phone. Um, yep. But they, well, the talking thermostat is no longer in production, or maybe it came back, I don't know, it had a problem. I have a talking thermostat at this point. Um, yeah. But they can be set with the, you know, with the smartphones. Now you can yeah. do thermostats that way, just like people do lights that way. Yep. And yep. I don't know that the people are going to have smartphones, but right. if, if, you know, maybe that would be a small expense that sure. would be provided for people if that's how you're going to control your figure, thermostat. We're going to figure it out. It, it's yeah. just we wouldn't have maybe thought of it without you bringing it to our attention. So I appreciate okay, that. Okay, well, that's why I'm here. <laughs> Some of the HVAC units have remotes too, which are buttons. So, you know, I don't know exactly what the solution will be, but we will definitely um, take on that challenge and try to figure out something that works for folks. Also, on the, uh, on the intercom, or if there's any way to contribute to um, for people that, that have to communicate between apartments. I don't know if you're doing that or if no, that's just going to be with a phone. You're not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I have a question. Um, just in terms of, I think it's great to have all this technology with the smartphones, you know, doing things like lights and inter, you know, but I'm wondering, God forbid there should be a power outage or a smartphone that's having trouble. Is there an alternative so that somebody doesn't freeze to death or whatever? I don't know. It's a dumb question. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't think we're going to be too high tech on this. We're going to have light switches no. and we're okay. going to have analog thermostats, regular okay. push button. Thermostats. You are. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure that there'd be some way, you know, an, uh, more than one way to do it. Yeah. Oh, speaking yeah. of I mean, HVAC, is there air conditioning in this building? Yes, there is. So. Okay. Cool. The, could the, I, uh, this is the, saying, could a generator be installed that will uh, address the problem yeah. with power outage? Yeah, let me talk about HVAC, then I'll talk about power outages. Okay. So the, the HVAC for this is likely to be the, um, all electric, the kind of air source heat pump mini splits that do both. Um, cooling mm -hmm. and heating. Um, we can get them in very small units and so each apartment can control its own temperature with a floor and a ceiling, which is a big deal for people to be able to have control over that. Um, we are trying to make this an all-electric building. It'll be the first one we've done where we don't have any kind of fossil fuels on site. Uh, mm -hmm. It does leave us a little bit vulnerable in the event of a power outage. Yep. So uh, we will think about whether we can afford um, both space and money for a backup generator. 
because that's a question. Some items like the elevator will have a battery backup that at least people won't get, you know, stuck in an elevator during a power outage. Um, we also mm -hmm. hope to have pho photovoltaic um, solar power at this yep. building. And there is technology advancing to be able to, to, to battery store some power that you can use for minimal kind of emergency services wouldn't run a whole building, but people could at least shelter in place. So I don't have the total answer to that, but it's an excellent question um, and certainly something we're gonna be exploring more. So you are gonna put solar panels on the roof? We are, we are, <laughs> we are sure hoping to, and that is really a budget question. So we will um, design for it and we hope to have sufficient money to be able to do it um, and own them. There's a number of ways to accomplish putting solar panels on. One is to rent them. We can't afford to buy them, but our first choice would be to buy them. The other um, unknown is there are various incentive programs. They change almost every year. So we, we, you know, we always plan for them and then how they actually get paid for is, is a moving target, but we want the building to be as both energy efficient and self-sufficient as possible. So how are you gonna be photovoltaic if you're not gonna have solar panels necessarily? Well, we are planning to, but I think okay. the question was, did we guarantee we were gonna have them or something? <laughs> but I, right, I no, so, I mean, otherwise it's gonna be an all electric building fueled by, uh, you know, like uh, Eversource, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, so I have a question. It, it, will, it, will, it will never be fully fueled by solar panels. There just isn't enough roof area or space right. to do yeah. it. But it is gotcha. possible to purchase electricity from a solar farm so that you can actually have, you know, a very sustainable energy model. Mm -hmm. Can you just, uh, you said it and I just missed it. Uh, if there is a power outage, what would happen to the elevators? <laughs> so the elevator if there's a fire, what happens to an elevator is it drops to the ground floor and it opens. Got it. If there's a power outage and you have a battery backup for the elevator, it goes to the nearest floor and it opens so that you don't have someone stuck inside Got the it. elevator. I'm assuming in the elevator, there's the uh, emergency phone. Or Correct. And would there, that it's, required, it's required by law. Yeah, there yeah. is. So will yeah. there be some in the office oh, I, I saw that up on that call or where will that call go so the call is required to go to a 24-hour line mm -hmm. um so we have our property management company has a 24-hour 24 7 emergency property management line mm -hmm. that we can tie into and some places require it to go to 911 as well and you mentioned that the the other uh, apartments uh, well, I know the other apartments have to be adaptable, but uh, what kind of features are in the adaptable units? Uh, I'm assuming the turning radius, you got a five foot turning radius in the bathroom, in the kitchen, and there's room to get around in the bedroom. Yeah, I'll let Tom answer that. Yeah, so, so they're, they're designed to the um, MAB uh, type one unit. Um, which has those features. The um, only thing that we're doing here <clears throat> that they allow for in that is the bath. We're having the bathroom door swing in. Oh yeah. Um, and we can always make it. We'll make it so we can have an accommodation to have that door swing out if that because the bathroom is small. If that becomes a, a problem with with the clearance. Yeah. Do you um, have the eighteen inches there? To swing it, to, to open it? Yeah, we will by the time. That fixture is probably not the one we're going to be using. I see. And yeah, it looks like in the accessible yet. units, you've got a tub with a tub seat. Yep. It's tub a shower. Showers, standard. With a seat. Okay. Actually, can I back, get back to appliances? The washing machines in the common laundry, same problem. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. There, it's very hard to find accessible washing machines. There are, there, there are, uh, there are units like the, I believe it's the Westinghouse or one of the other larger companies that specialize. They, they have all um, accessible 
um, units, but they have all accessible appliances. Well, accessible for some people, but not accessible for other people. Right. Well, there's it, always a two-edged sword there. So it's, uh, no, there a lot of washing machines you buy now are touch screens or they're they're little buttons that go around and around and around and don't have any stop point. Um, this is a big issue for blind people. So it, it's not very easy to find them. Right. Yeah, um, the, the accessibility for folks in wheelchairs is very far advanced over the accessibility, I would think, for people with vision impairment. It's not yep. something that gets the same level of attention. So Correct. True. Um, more attention I have a you're here. This is Tori, and I have a question about the accessible apartment on on um, the second floor. Yep. And if if there's a power outage or a fire, um, yep. and that person's in a wheelchair, um, how are they going to get down? Right. Do you want to talk about this also, Tom? About the shelter in place. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a problem. It's always a problem. Um, I'm just pulling up the floor plan on my own thing here. Um, the so the code, you know, the code has that we have an area. It's not a standard area of refuge. It's not not a a full area of refuge. Um, but there's an area by the stairs that someone can go to. So it's in a fire rated shaft, so that the idea is that it's in a stairwell, and you have a rated rated separation. But you still you you still need to have someone come and help you get down the stairs. Oh yep. man! But this, there's two egress stairs that are, you know, uh, two hour fire rating and lead directly to the outside. So in terms of fire safety, um, uh, this is going to be a fully. <laughs> So the fire department will be alerted that that whoever is living on the second floor in that accessible apartment will yeah, need be assistance. waiting in that area. Right. Okay. So in terms of fire safety, this will be a fully sprinklered building. Um, we will have hardwired smoke and fire detectors and CO2 detectors. So at least there will be, you know, good protection for tenants in the event of a fire, and someone will get there quickly. I'm glad to hear about the sprinkler. That's yeah. a good yeah. thing. So actually what you're, I, I mean, I'm just thinking about it in terms of Tori's question. There are no apartments that are roll in, go to your apartment and use your key. They're all up or down. Right. That's correct. Yep. They're all they're all up in this case. Oh, yeah. Okay. They're up up one or up two, up yep. one half or up one and a half. Okay. Yep. And that's be, because there's a slight slope to the um, site. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. The only way to have the entrance was to have it at a middle zone. Hmm. Yeah. The on, issue on the, is on, on the ground you floor, you can um, exit the building to the lower level. To the so, patio. To the patio. And you could, if you were coming from the street, you could, in fact, um, you know, go along the pat the paths to the lower level and enter the building there. You don't have to enter at the entrance. Again, with Tori's question, if it were not a fire but a power failure, you said it would go to the nearest floor and open. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if Tori lived upstairs and it was in the middle floor where it let her out, I think you can set it to go, I think you can ask it to go to, to a floor. You can? Yeah. Okay. I think it can't go, I, I think it can't, can't go up lots of floors, but it can certainly go down. But it would only be one floor anyway. Right. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking if I were the person stuck in the elevator in a power failure and it put me on the wrong floor and there were nothing I could do about it, that would be a big problem for me. Yep. Yeah, well, and that's why the elevator has a phone because at that point, that you know, everyone in the building needs assistance if the elevator's not working. Not really. In this, People are in their own apartments. It's fine. Yeah, but it if is programmable. Somebody isn't. Hmm. I think in this building, in this case, it makes the most sense really to go down to the ground floor because at the ground floor, then you have 
do at grade exits to the building from the building. Well, yeah, that's some, true. And there's a common room you can always wait in, I guess, instead of a hallway. Right. So it should have to go to the down just like the other one and not let you off on the nearest floor because for, for Tori and Joe and Sarah, and that would be a real problem. Yeah. Well, except on the ground floor, you do have two at grade exits. So once you're right. on the ground floor, you right. could go out either. On the ground floor, it's fine. But what, what you had said originally was that it was going to let you out at the nearest floor. Yeah. And that's not okay for people who can't get to the ground floor without the elevator. Right. Yeah. Yep. You know, I think that if we if we focus on worst case scenarios, uh, we we'll, we won't get anywhere. Well, I mean, I think that we all. That's not that unlikely. Elevators fail. When we when we live in a community, we all take our risks. When I lived in the Clark House, I was on the fourth floor, and I knew damn well that if there was a fire, you know, I go to the fire rated area and hope to God that the fire. <laughs> fire department will show up. Uh, otherwise, everybody would want an apartment on the ground floor. I think that, you know, if we cover the major areas of access for everyone, then we got, uh, that, that's the biggest battle. If we cover all the worst case scenarios, then we could, you know, what if an atomic bomb goes off or something? You know, no, I don't think it's so worst case scenario to think that an elevator could have a power issue. And, you know, yeah. not all of us would want an apartment on the first floor because some of us could run down the fire escape. I mean, a lot of people who are low income or otherwise disabled can run down the stairway and get out. So right. I, think, I think accommodations for people who really need them, especially since it has to be built now, I think we have to think about what's going to happen to that elevator automatically. Right. So just for you folks to think about as a policy issue is, you know, there's there's a mandate to basically sprinkle accessible units throughout a building and not congregate them in one location. Um, and when you do that in a multi-story building, you end up with some accessible units on upper floors. Um, whereas the safest place for those units is probably all on the, the main ground floor. And so there's a little bit of a tension between those two kind of objectives, public policy objectives. In our case, we don't have, we're working with the grades that are here, so we don't have a place to put people that they can just get to right from grade. But in other buildings, multi-story buildings, we have this conversation regularly. In fact, sometimes people won't apply for a unit if they're in a wheelchair and it's an upper floor unit. They're like, no way. <laughs> you know? yeah. well, I want to know I can get out. I'm like Joe, who was, you know, willing to live on the fourth floor so but it, it's a tension that exists within our within our industry mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. joe do you still live at clark no i moved out of there 30 okay. years ago when you know it's it's a it's a different it's a it's a mixed uh you know it's uh at that point before i was a senior it was uh senior housing and uh housing for uh, people with disabilities. So if I had my stereo on three, I know I'd have someone knocking on my door. Uh, so, and you know, and it was, and I really didn't want to come in every, uh, every evening and uh, get uh, the third degree from, you know, where you've been and has the mail come in and, uh, and get hassled about my PCAs. That's, uh, that was one of the biggest problems, the lifestyles, and people not trusting uh, people who are PCAs, particularly if they were minorities. Um, people been, you know, people were very mistrustful, and I don't know if it was if it goes along with the uh, um, with the uh, generation uh, or just individuals who are just not just mistrustful in the first place of anybody who doesn't look or talk like they, like they do. So anyway, I was, no, I got out. All right, the reason I'm asking is because I'm living on your former floor. <laughs> you in, are you in 420? I'm in 408. <laughs> oh, you got the, the one bedroom. The 420 I is, love 420 it. is it, my apartment, so if I want to go back, I know it's open. I, 
I'm actually very happy here. It's run, re I guess it changed hands and it's run really well now, but I can see your issues, but um, I just, I just thought it was a coincidence. You know, that's why I asked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great location. That's all I can say. Yeah. But back then they actually had stores and amenities that Correct. you actually want rather that's than, right. you know, clothing stores and, and pizza places and Chinese restaurants. There's nothing down there for uh, a resident, really. So that's correct. That's a whole nother, but that's a whole nother issue. Yep. You know, with those ugly buildings down there, it's, yep. uh, it, it's just un, even more undesirable. Um, while we still have Agreed. our guests, let, let's, let's stay, try to stay on that topic. On the topic, yeah. 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 So I believe I talked with Joe at one point because one of the critiques we've gotten about this site is, you know, is it truly walkable for people? What if you're in a, in a wheelchair? It's, there's a hill to go up, there's a hill to go down. So, you know, we just explored the different transport options that are available. Um, and luckily there seems to be pretty decent van service. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Yeah, if you want to wait two hours for a five-minute trip, sure. <laughs> There's some van service <laughs> available. Um, so I know we there can- There is a hill. There is, so obviously where this is located, this is on the, that hill of yep. route, uh, that stretch of Route 9. Yep. Um, and currently there isn't a sidewalk on that side of the road. However, Mass oh. DOT, correct? Well, there is. There is a sidewalk I on our side of the road. Is that goes oh, okay. from our property into town. Into town. Yeah. It doesn't go downhill. And then there's a oh. sidewalk on the opposite side of Route 9 that goes the full distance. Okay, but so I believe Mass, o uh, Mass DOT is extending that sidewalk yeah. to go to, um, to University Drive on your, okay. si on your okay. side. And um, the Mass DOT is also putting in bike lanes on both sides of the road of Route 9, of that stretch. Yeah, so they're doing five foot wide multi-use paths on both sides of Route 9, nine that will be wider and at least initially much better condition um, than the walkways that are there now. And they're also putting in two blinking crossings because a lot of people cross Route 9, especially to get to the athletic field um, or if you're on one side to get to town um, and it's it's busy. Um, so they're oh putting- boy. Two different crossings in, one at Orchard and one at Hazel Street. Is there a bus stop near there, there? There is not. Huh. Oh, I don't know if we could get one. I mean, the bus system is kind of tailored to the colleges and university. So it goes down University Drive and up around and into town and then back. So you, there are lots of bus stops that are not too far, but it doesn't go up and down that section of Northampton Road. Yeah. I, think I have a question. Else, oh, okay. Sorry. No, if we could ask, you know, I, I know it'd be difficult to ask PBTA to put a bus stop there. It would depend on the usage and how many people would actually yeah. be, on, be on the yeah. bus. And yeah, I think that's, I think that's, that's, that's a tough one. I think that's right. It's always hard to get them to change. <laughs> um, yeah. And, you know, if we didn't have people who really needed it, then it wouldn't make a lot of sense. Well, we need, to, we need to make sure the sidewalks are in good shape or in yeah. wide enough and don't have yeah. potholes or giant tree, uh, tree roots right. in the way. Yep. Oh, yeah. My question is, um, I guess, how did you determine 28 units? That Was it just a, this is how much money we need to make so that we can afford to build the building? Or because I'm thinking these um, the common spaces um, are pretty small for 28 people. So yeah. I was wondering how you came up with 28 since the apartments aren't very big. Um, it seemed, it would seem like maybe fewer apartments and more common space. I don't know, but it probably is a financial question. I just wondered yeah. how you came yeah. up with that. You know, some of it's the economics, both of building it and operating it. Um, some of it is just looking at models that we're already familiar with and properties that we already manage. Um, we did a fit test originally. We could build out the site more and have higher density. Um, we're finding the neighbors are already very agitated about the level of density that we're proposing. 
you know, we're trying to do a lot of things at the same time. We're trying to house people who are homeless, but not um, congregate them. We want to mix them with other folks of different income tiers. And there are a lot of single person households and a lot of people needing housing who are very low, low income single persons. And that's our priority is getting people under shelter <laughs> kind of first. So a third forward. of the units are for people who make almost $50,000 for one person. And up to, that, up to, up to, that, but I mean, but it could yeah, be was, and the was, people in the jobs that you named, yep. um, you know, a lot, there's a lot of people in this town that do work like that. Yep. And I'm wondering if they're going to want a 235 foot apartment with, have, almost, they, with almost no common space. So is there any kind of flexibility? For example, if you can't fill the 80% units because of what I said, can you put more lower income people or do they have to stay vacant? How, you know, what, what happens with yeah. the numbers of uh, vacant units if you can't fill them? Sure. So it's very rare in our affordable housing sector that we can't fill units. And it's okay. a, a product of what the market is for regular units. Um, so it, it, if someone's making $48,000 a year, they'll have choices about where to live. They may not choose this location. Right. So that's right. a ceiling. It's not a floor for, for what someone, they need to be able to earn enough to pay the rent. Right. The rent is between $650 and $700 with all the utilities included. There are no other choices in Amherst no. at right. that price point. And the location is great. So if you want to live, if you work at Amherst College or you work at UMass or you work in downtown North um, Amherst and you want to walk or bike to work, you can't beat it. It's a great location. So I think we'll attract some people who are looking for a simple lifestyle where they don't want to have a car. Um, they want to have a small footprint and they just want their own space. It's like a little micro apartment. Um, so I think it will be suitable for a lot of different kinds of people. Okay. Um, Laura, areas I'd like one second, one second. common areas are wonderful. They don't always even get used. So yeah. again, right. our priority for square footage is housing people um, okay. first. Laura, do you have any, what is the policy going to be for visitors so, that will spend overnight, stay right. overnight? <laughs> right, another hot topic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it typically in when when the units are this small, we don't allow overnight guests in our other buildings. However, Sober. we've had a lot yes. of, however, we've had a lot of feedback from people in Amherst in general. One of them was they thought that we should allow overnight guests. So we're trying a compromise uh, where people can have overnight guests for up to three nights if they give notice in advance to property management that they're having someone stay. Wow. Um, and as long as it's not a problem for other tenants that that person is there, they don't create problems for other people. Um, but it's tight quarters. These are small units. Um, as Myra is saying, the, the common area is limited. So it's a balancing act of people having rights to have guests and then other people having rights to have quiet and know who's in their building and not have a lot of strangers. Is that reflected in the lease? It's reflected in, yes, it is, in the proposed okay. lease. Yep. Okay, great. Um, there are two, there are two areas I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to address. One is I, I saw on one of the slides a lottery system, and mm -hmm. the other part I'd like to address are the adaptable features. Uh, so with the lottery, now, yeah. how do you uh, envision this lottery system to work so that it doesn't exclude uh, people with uh, disabilities? So you mean the application process itself being inclusive? Yes. Is that your question? Yeah. So um, we'll have we'll have written materials. We'll also have um, trainings, you know, information sessions people can come to and hear about it. Um, people can request assistance with filling out the application. Um, we will translate the application into other languages if people request that of us. So we, we try to keep it pretty inclusive. Um, some of the more high need folks will have service providers, honestly, or social workers that will assist them with getting their paperwork together and getting a full packet in. We try to keep the bar pretty low for the initial lottery. So, if, you know, to try to 
let as many people in as possible. And then if you float to the top of that lottery and you're a candidate for a unit, that's when you kind of need to deliver certain paperwork that can be onerous for people. But we try to help people. That's the whole point of this housing is... is Are there going to be strict timeline, guideline, I mean, uh, deadlines for when applications have to be in? There are. Yep. There are. Yep. Mm. So we have a marketing period that's usually a few months long with some information sessions, and then there's a point in time with the lottery deadline. You can still apply after that, but you won't be in the lottery. So you'll be at the end of the wait list that is generated by the lottery. I will tell you for the accessible units that anyone needing an accessible unit has almost the highest priority you can have for those units because we don't want we want to match people who need those units with those units. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You don't want someone who doesn't need an accessible unit. If you're 68th on the lottery, but you need an accessible unit, and no one above you does, you're going to bounce above all those folks, as long as you're income eligible. I see. Um, oh, so you're not going to have like a separate lottery for the accessible units? Nope. Okay. It's, just a it's just a preference. Just like okay. the income, you know, everybody goes into a big pool. I mean, there's a lot of ways to do lotteries, but, um, and then there, there's kind of a matchmaking that goes on with the different income tiers. And, you know, if someone needs a sensory unit or they need a, a wheelchair accessible unit, we match people up. Or if they have a homeless preference. Can I suggest that uh, we move on because, um, yeah, to the chair, because we've spent a lot of time on this project. And I know, Maureen, there are, there are a couple of other things, not big things, but there are a couple of other things on okay. the agenda. We're running out of time. Okay, so it, uh, after this meeting, if anyone has any other comments or questions, feel free to email me or call me and I can uh, redirect them to Laura. Yep. Um, but before we move on, um, oh, there's someone that's raising their hand, David uh, Scott. Um, should, uh, this isn't a public hearing, uh, Jerry, do we want to take public comment? Do we know it? I don't know who David Scott is. Jerry? I, I know, yeah, I'm looking, um, I don't, I guess I don't have access to other people in the meeting. Yeah, I do as the host. Well, before oh, okay. we, we, and then there's another per, uh, there's one person that, there's a few people um, and then we have a Brian H that's raising their hand. Um, oh, I didn't know this was open to, I wouldn't have given my address out. <laughs> sorry. Um, so before we deal, uh, Jerry, before you respond, whether you want to, there's three people that now are raising their hand and they just joined the meeting. I'm wondering, okay, before we deal with that, Jerry, think about whether you would like to uh, take public comment um, while I say this next set statement. I, I think this is a great opportunity for the board to make a motion of whether they, um, you know, recommend this project to the ZBA um, with with your suggested comments. Does that does so, that make sense? Um, but yes. before, sh but Jerry, should we take these? Um, well, um, the, my, all of a sudden. Question all of a sudden there's like a, a bunch of people they're just now joining this meeting just joining i don't know late. i don't know what that means well it's almost one o'clock is there someone else scheduled yeah it might just be zoom? somebody else no. using the zoom no. oh okay um well the first question i would have for everybody who's got their hand up is uh, are there are they making comments or questions about the accessibility because i know that this project is um created a lot of controversy among different people. And there may be people joining in who just want to um, make comments or questions about the general project. And this really should be um, focused on accessibility issues. Yeah, and also this is a, not a public hearing. That's um, right. And so uh, this the, uh, the commission is not required to take public comments. So, um, since we're out, we're virtually and out of time, and the meeting is about to end, um, I would have I could we could ask all those people who have questions or comments to send them, and we'll do our best to either pass them on to Laura and her 
her group or answer them ourselves as if we can. Sure. You know what? I'm going to pull up my email address. Um, so bear with me. Um, hold on one second. I'm just going to go to the Amherst. Ooh. And um, sorry, I can't do two things at the same time. So bear with me. Uh, I'm going to go to the Disability Access Advisory Committee and I'm going to share my screen. So people that are watching um, or that are just joining us, um, you can, um, let's see here. Can everyone see this? I'm, whoopsies. Yeah. Yes. You can, oh, okay. Uh, oh, it doesn't show my email. Uh, let's see here. But you can click it, I bet. Yeah. So, yeah. You know what? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, um, can you see my work? Can you see my word? Can you see this? Oh, you we know what? Your, we see uh, your phone this, number. This is, I'm going to do something. Hold on one second. Okay. I'm taking my signature from an email. Okay. I'm going to do a new share. Oh, here we go. Can everyone see this? I see your mouse, but that's it. You yeah, don't see just nothing. No. Okay, yeah, hold, okay hold on. Okay, bear with there me, bear with me. Okay, it's there coming. It oh, you there can't see it. Oh, okay, I'm gonna make this gigantic so everyone can see this, hopefully. Better. Okay, all right, so this is uh, my contact information. Um, this is my direct phone number. So if you want to um, have any comments or questions, you can direct them to this phone number. And now I'm gonna highlight my email. So my email is pollockm at amersma.gov. So it's pollock, P-O-L-L-O-C-K-M as in Maureen at amersma.gov, A-M-H-E-R-S-T-M-A.gov. And then my direct line is 413-259-3120. And uh, and now getting back to the comment about making a motion, I've, I have um, have written down comments uh, that that the board has uh, made and questions uh, have provided. And some of the key uh, comments I've heard today is that uh, about the back patio uh, uh, commission committee members would love to see that brick not be used for the back patio that uh, uh, maybe a concrete, a, a smoother surface, such as a concrete with a stamp be put down um, might be better for people with uh, cr crutches or wheelchairs or strollers. And um, of course that, that it be shoveled uh, for snow and ice during the winter months. Um, I heard a suggestion uh, about having a beacon at the egresses on the outside uh, for visually impaired. Uh, Not only at the egresses. I mean, yeah. in any kind of a common laundry Okay, room. yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. Right. Uh, so for the common, for the interior common areas and then at the, at the two exterior egresses for tenants and for visitors uh, that have visual impairments. Um, let's see here. I heard comments about um, can uh, appliances such as microwave, intercom, HVAC, and washer and dryer, can those uh, be looked into for, uh, for, for those that are visually impaired? So perhaps um, options that have settings not only touch screen, but uh, maybe can be controlled by smartphones. Um, or by dials. Or dials, thank you. Okay, what else? Uh, what else did I hear? Um, let's see here. Um, the house will be sprinkled, uh, walkable, uh, transit. Just where the elevator empties out. Oh, sh sh uh, is that a comment or a question? Oh, no, it, it was, for me, it was a comment to make sure yeah. that the elevator empties people out in a place where they can B. Yeah, so as Laura had indicated during a power outage, the elevator would have a like a, a backup battery that will I'm gonna stop share the hold on a second. Um 
during a power outage. Yeah, she did say that. Uh, that the elevator would bring you to the next available, the next floor and open up. Um, and perhaps uh, the, uh, Tom will look into whether um, the person using that elevator can choose which floor they want. Um, and then during a fire, the, the person the person would get in the elevator and it would bring you down to the ground floor and um, it would automatically open. I don't like the perhaps, but otherwise I'm, I agree. I mean, if I were in a wheelchair and I got dumped on the first floor and I lived on the second floor, it would be a problem. Yeah, so Tom will look into that. I'm yeah, sure. and, so yeah. I, I agree completely and it is okay. programmable. So we take note that it should go to the ground floor. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I'm just really quickly going through my notes, um, but those were sort of the major focuses of our conversation. And luckily with Zoom, there's a transcript, an automatic transcript of this yeah. uh, recording. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't downloaded any of them, but I'm going to, this will be my first attempt to download the transcript after this meeting. This, this meeting uh, has been recorded uh, as indicated, and it will be posted on uh, the town's YouTube channel. Um, and once that is, IT does that. So uh, that will probably be up on our YouTube channel in the next few days, and I can email everyone a copy if that's helpful. So with all that, does anyone else have any other uh, comments or questions that, I, that you wanna raise, or if there's something that I missed? Yeah, uh, I did want to address the uh, adaptability, adaptability uh, features in the uh, the other units. We mm -hmm. never got around to that. I know we talked about the the turning radius in the bathroom in the kitchen, um, but we didn't uh, we didn't see I didn't see the uh, bedroom uh, to see what uh, uh, what the uh, measurements are to get around the bedroom. So, you know, those are the only, I'm part of the part I didn't uh, see. Um, would would uh, everybody be able to see those things on the big document that we have a link to? Maybe. The floor Maybe. plan? I mean, Laura and Tom should have the floor plan right now if you want to take a look. Oh. Didn't they have it up already? Yeah, we yeah we had the floor plan up. I mean, we yeah. we put there there is space. We threw a lot of furniture in there that doesn't necessarily need to be in there. Um, in terms of the in terms of the unit and and move around, there is space. They're tight. One area of adaptability that we're always struggling with how best to deal with is the kitchens. Um, we can make. Uh, we sometimes, you know, make the kitchen, uh, the sink cabinet removable. Um, and then the question is in a unit this small, is it, is it even worth, you would probably, you would want to change over, basically take all the base cabinets out, have a countertop or a lower height and um, have a cooktop. Well, if we're talking about adaptable, I want to, you know, I just am curious about, again, the five foot turning radius and whether or not cabinets are able to be easily removed, whether or not there's backing in the bathrooms for grab bars. Grab bars. Yeah, we do that anyway. Yeah, we do that. And I think, it, well, I was gonna say, when these kitchens are so small that we, we would probably end up removing, you know, the entire unit and section. This is Ruth, I'm gonna to have to leave the meeting very soon. So can we oh take a, a Yeah, and I had a motion. question as well. All right, I'm just, Question whether or not that's truly adaptable if we can't, uh, if I can't get in and around the, uh, the kitchen. In the well, the kitchen and the bedroom, it, it's one room. So this turning radius is there, depending on how much furniture you put in that one room. Okay. Tom, you were verifying that the turning radius is there in the bathroom in the non ADA. Well, these, so in a type one unit, you, you're not required to have a turning radius in the bathroom. They have clearances. The door, what's the conflict with it is the door, I mean, the, sorry, the, the conflict is that the door swings in. And you're you're allowed to have an in-swinging door if you, if you can make a combination to have the door swing out. 
Well, yeah. I'll be happy to. I'll look at my at my regs, and uh, I'm assuming all the light switches are up high enough, and the usual stuff. And there's room around the bedroom to get in and around. Yeah, it's early times yet, so we definitely would appreciate any kind of feedback you want to give on that. Sure, I'll do that on my. Uh, I'll send that to Maureen. Yeah. I can't hear you. You're muted. Are we ready to make a motion, or should this be continued? I would move that we accept the plan as proposed with the comments. What's the motion? So you're recommending, you're providing a positive recommendation of the submitted plans as discussed with the comments. Correct. Okay. Based on accessibility. I mean, that's really all that we have the purview. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. No, that's Thank you. what this committee Thank is you. all about. So. Right. But with the comments, I mean, we've we've made a comments toward accessibility, and you know what what the ZBA does with it might have nothing to do with accessibility. Well, there will be also a public hearing, if I'm not mistaken. So there will be. All right. There will be. Yeah. And we discussed the comments, and so um, that will be captured in this motion, and uh, I will provide Laura the transcripts and. Uh, Thank you. The YouTube video. And again, if, if there's any other comments or questions that you think of, again, feel free to call me or, or send me an email and I'll forward them to Laura and Tom and Jan. Yeah. That would be really helpful. Can we do a roll call? Because actually that is required for Zoom meetings. Uh, Could you for read the, the motion, please? Okay. Uh, so Ruth is making the motion that the DAAC uh, provide a, a positive recommendation for for the uh, project at 132 North Northampton Road for for the eight uh, regarding the ADA components of the project with yes. the with the comments um, uh, discussed. I'll second it. Who's that? You can you say your name please? This is Joe Tringali. Okay. I'll second the motion. Okay, second by Joe. And uh, can everyone say their name? Say their name and yes or nay. Myra, yes. Elise, yes. Joe Tringali. Jerry, yes. And Ruth, yes, of course. <laughs> okay. Did, did Tor Elise. Sarah, uh, I, I, uh, Sarah and I believe had another meeting. She had a slip out. Okay. And what Tori too. Tori? And Tori, Tori had to leave. Elise, did you vote? Yes. Um, I think I said yes. You oh, okay. Okay, so that's one, two, three, four, five, 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 zero, a positive vote. Right, so thank you all. Thank you, uh, Jane and Tom and Laura. Thank you for your Thank time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank appreciate you. It. Some great comments. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All well, right. We'll leave. You can decide whether you want to keep meeting or not. <laughs> uh, I, I have another, I'm 11 minutes late for my next meeting. Yeah, I so, gotta go. Okay, Thank so. Thank you very much. Let's Good adjourn. Evening. Okay. okay. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye, everybody. I, guess I just want to make bye. one comment about the voting. Um, the legislature is dealing with it. Um, and I think that there are going to be, it's going to be possible for, as it is for servicemen, for people uh, who, who need to, to vote online. Okay, Great. so uh, uh, also you. I just, okay, uh, just want, sorry to interrupt you. Saren just sent me an email, she was muted. And so it is six zero. Uh-huh. I don't know if that's counting, but I, I, I have to go now. But um, Myra, we'll discuss that at the next meeting. Okay. Okay. Have a great day. Okay. Bye.